All right, good afternoon, everyone. I will begin as any good host, really, by assaulting my audience with some numbers. The WEF has done all the hard work by crunching the numbers, and here they are. To generate $1,000 of GDP, a country today must consume 460 kilograms of materials, 111 kilograms of energy. So simply stated, $1,000 of growth costs 416 kilos of materials and 111 kilos of energy. Under these circumstances, what we're asking ourselves today is how can carbon emission targets be achieved without compromising the global economy? Now, in this session, we'll debate relationship between economic growth and decarbonization. We aim to solve the green growth equation here to help us some differing perspectives. Jennifer Morgan, Executive Director, Greenpeace International. Andrew Liveris, member of the board at Saudi Aramco. Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England. And Mariana Matsukata, Professor of Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London. So thank you all for joining us. Jennifer Morgan, let me kick off with you. Um, to achieve decarbonization, what is the green nirvana? What would we actually have to give up in order to make it more sustainable? I have to say, I think that might be um, a false question, if I may, um, because I think that it's more that um, if we don't shift away from our existing economy that's based on fossil fuels, <coughs> what we will be facing. So the the impacts that we are seeing happening already around the world uh, are massive, and the costs of those are massive, even for a country that is as wealthy as Australia. So I think the question really is more, what's holding us back in moving into that economy? Because it's there, it's been there for a long time, that's there for the grasp. But w what would we implement now? Would we only be allowed to travel by train? Would we eat less meat? What are the top three things that, that you see the world doing to become better? So I think the first thing that would happen is that the private banks should stop investing in fossil fuels. They have been investing trillions in fossil fuels uh, and move into investments in low carbon, zero carbon infrastructure and renewable energy. And you would put in place laws that would do that. You would be powering the world with 100% renewable energy uh, and you would be putting in place the incentives and the infrastructure uh, to do that so people could get around by uh, high-speed rail uh, powered by renewable energy. You would eat uh, less and better uh, meat and dairy, and we would have uh, a common agriculture policy, for example, in the European Union that would move away from industrial agriculture and support ecological agriculture. Um, so in every sector, there's really something that's there that needs to happen. And I think on the whole, we'll, we'll have cleaner cities and better air uh, and healthier people because um, it, the, the pathway is actually quite a beneficial one for people. Andrew Livers, could we do without fossil fuel? I believe, the, I believe the answer to that is yes, and I not just don't speak with a Saudi Aramco hat there. I speak with my former hat as a major industrialist running one of the largest industrial companies in the world. Um, the notion of growth that isn't sustainable doesn't work. Sustainable growth, uh, I, I hate the word sustainable in front of growth because if growth isn't sustainable, we shouldn't be in business. So the ecosystem that we're living in called this planet is strained to the limit. We have only one planet last time we checked that we can live on. So we've got to do something about the humanity that we've inhabited the planet with. And fossil fuels, the fuel of the 20th century, um, its days are numbered, are not over, but they're transitioning to be over, to answer that question. Mm -hmm. How do we get there is a range of different things that have to be done. The criticality that I'm sure the governor's going to talk about, which is finance and how finance speaks, is a biggie. Mm -hmm. uh, regulation and legislation around the world, uh, Paris, the climate change accords, and really putting oomph behind that. And then innovation, which I know everyone's going to speak about here on this panel, but while I've got the floor, uh, is really key. The swath of available technologies to humanity today, the ability to put policies in place from efficiency to alternatives to carbon, hydrogen economy, uh, all the things we can do to actually transition away from coal and oil, ultimately to electrification and, and really, truly natural gas plays a role, is all available to us today. What lacks is alignment and will and purpose for all of the various groups to get together to make that happen. And in my new life, but, I'm putting a lot of time into that, actually. But how can the strategy of big oil actually be compatible with the yeah. net zero world? Well, look, uh, the term big oil is almost a, a Neanderthal term. I think we've got to realize these companies are energy companies. Um, energy companies like Aramco have realized that this is a time and a place that humanity is speaking, communities are speaking, 
audiences around the world, including hopefully more shareholders, are basically voting with their feet, and basically we're going to have to respond to that. Saudi Aramco is a newly formed public company, and there is a KPI, the UN SDGs are pretty key to this. Let's put the KPIs in place and let's help big oil become truly energy companies and let them manage their own transitions. They can afford it and they should be able to afford it. We should work together to make it so it's not punitive to the immediate world. You know, we can't get there overnight. So there are ways to get there. Jennifer yeah. talked about them and we can't. Uh, Governor Carney, you're leading the crusade to wake up investors, right, to climate related risks. Are they listening? Uh, I think they are, and it's, it's certainly not uh, not listening to me, but uh, they're listening um, <laughs> to um, uh, to the realities that we're touching on. So this is these issues have moved very swiftly from being corporate social responsibility issues or more niche issues within finance to fundamental value drivers. Um, I I think we're seeing a fundamental reshaping of. Uh, of the financial system, I'm I'm quoting someone else and using that uh, that term, but uh, and there was a lot of publicity for a large asset manager uh, last week. But that seven trillion joined another 110 trillion dollars of balance sheet that's looking for climate disclosure and not just climate static disclosure, but disclosure around transition. So let me make a core point and pass back, which is. What we're talking about is a transition from where we are today to where we need to get to. And the question is, we need to speak a common language about uh, units and time frame. Um, but let, let, let me give you um, one variant of this. Uh, Paris stretch goal, one and a half degrees, 66% probability. We have eight and a half years, some, thereabouts. So, you round it up to eight and a half years on current emissions trajectories. Okay? What does that mean for the fuel mix um, that's going to be produced, what technologies are profitable, which, who are the winners, who are the losers in that, what's their horizon. There are other ways to do these calculations, but what you need is common, uh, common information, common understanding, and then a market in it. And what is happening is that with the major investors, this is becoming the question. What's your plan to get to net zero of every corporate? Yeah. It's a question, what's Aramco's view on net zero? What is your old company, Dow's yeah. Chemicals, plan to get to net zero? Oh, Microsoft has just done this to get to net negative. What are people's plans? And that will, uh, that will determine where capital is flowing, obviously influenced by uh, public opinion, pressure, and government policy as well, but that moving from, if I may, from the periphery hmm. to absolutely the mainstream is what's going to drive transition. But, uh, and, and I might add growth and jobs. Wh why don't we have a harmonization of, of definitions? Uh, we're 2020. Uh, uh, yep, we're 2020. Uh, look, the first real uh, comprehensive definitions came out four years ago. Four years ago. Uh, actually, the mandate to do it came out four years ago. The actual definitions came out two and a half years ago. Uh, they're being refined this year. Just came from a meeting with the IBC. They're looking to reduce them down. And uh, we expect by COP26 uh, in Glasgow uh, this November that we will have uh, the refined definitions of this climate disclosure. And the leading jurisdictions, we want to make those disclosures mandatory. But the core thing we want to get as part of the dialogue, and you're helping with it, and everyone around this table and, and, this, and watching can help with it, is to make sure that the core question for any business or any financial provider is, what's your plan for the transition? Where are you on that path? What are you doing about it? Um, and have that uh, sophisticated conversation, because that's what, alongside you know, climate policy and government initiatives, are going to drive uh, a just transition. And Maria Matsukata, first, how long does this transition actually take place? And what mechanisms should we put in place to tilt the market towards more green energy policies? Well. There's lots of talk right now, and people are talking about an urgency to this, right? So there's the business roundtable saying we absolutely must change how we do business. And I think what the opportunity is right now about this purposeful company kind of talk is what would it look like if you bring that purpose to the center of this discussion? And if you bring government to the picture, given that markets aren't just kind of out there putting pressure on company, markets are in fact outcomes of how public, private, increasingly third sector institutions are governed and how they relate one to another, 
Currently, we have three times more government subsidies going to fossil fuels than to climate solutions, but also how we do government, whether it's procurement, industrial strategy, grants and loans, does not have this at its core. The procurement budget, just for the country where I live in the UK, is three times larger than the innovation budget. What if we procure differently? What if we do the loans of a public bank in such a way that they're conditional on the transformation of sectors? In Germany, we were yeah. just talking the steel sector has lowered its material content, so its carbon emissions, not because it just woke up and said, I want to be purposeful. It had to in order to get the loan from the KFW's public bank. Um, and this call for bailouts from steel in the US, steel in Italy right now is asking to be bailed out. They should be you know, strongly conditional on transformation of those sectors towards these targets. And this is about innovation. You don't just you know, reduce your material, you do it through innovation and investment, and that's a long-run driver of growth and innovation yeah, and productivity. Could try and make a quick point here. One of the things, the more we're actually talking about transition, the more we'll see what's easy and what's hard. What's hard exposes <clears throat> where the opportunities are for innovation. So one of the things that is, I mean, the uh, electricity transformation is relatively easy given the existing technologies that are out there. The only thing, the thing that's hard about it is the existing stock and the transition to that. But what is harder is around things like the extent to which there's going to be carbon capture and storage and the technologies around that. Shining a light on that battery technology, which has made a lot of progress, it needs a bit more of a push. Th those areas where you get the focus on what's crucial for the transition, that's when money starts to flow in a way that will really make a difference, both public money for primary research yeah. and private money with the right signal, but it's got to be framed in the way, right way. Yeah, so I laud, I just want to add, I laud the urgency coming out of the financial world. Uh, the regulatory world has been slow and governments have been slow, even though we've got Paris. But I think this whole point you just made, Mark, is really key. And I do think uh, corporations, leading corporations have already responded, but there are a lot of laggards. And so what needs to happen is we need to get very serious on the financial side on these KPIs. And we also need to understand that there is a transition available right now. I mean, I'll take my home country of Australia with the tipping point of the bushfires. Uh, that is a tipping point. That conversation is no longer. The economic harm done to Australia okay, by those ravages that have occurred, whether you attribute it to climate change or not, it does happen, and it's happening with more frequency. So now, Australia is a big coal exporter, and Australia is a big user of coal-fired fired, uh, coal power plants. There's natural gas available right away. Uh, a 10-year economic transition or 8.5-year economic yeah. transition would lower emissions by over 40%. We can do that now. What stops that is the lack of courage by policymakers, okay? And in fact, many of these companies are not responding you know, to get us out of coal and put us into natural gas. Actually, natural gas should not be the stopping point, okay? But, but is You've it got... more expensive? And actually, do you need nuclear? Well, nuclear, of course, is the ultimate answer, and you know, a lot of people working on safe nuclear and how we actually put that in place. I'm a fan of nuclear. I know maybe others <laughs> aren't. I do think we have to put nuclear into the mix, but let's you know, make that a conversation that says to the zero carbon discussion. If I want zero carbon, if I want minus 1.5, if I want to get to this you know, zero emissions world, I've got to figure a way to get the safe technologies out there now. I think the safe bet, low-hanging fruit, is natural gas-fired power until we get to safe nuclear and until we get to things like hydrogen and safe batteries and affordable batteries. Jennifer Morris. So I actually want to come in on, I think nuclear, it's fairly obvious that the risks are very high. And yep. so Good building point. new nuclear right now, um, but I want to come in on the gas issue mm -hmm. because I hear a lot of gas being the bridge into, uh, and I, I think that we don't actually want to invest in an infrastructure for gas when we know that that won't get us all the way where we need to go. I agree and with that. And that we should be investing in the renewable infrastructure, I agree with right? the part that it won't get us to where we need to go. I don't agree with the part that it can't be a bridge. But anyway, keep going. I mean, I just think, <laughs> well, that's a start. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, so I, because I think if you were to take the funds, if you're looking at government funds and yeah. where they're going, yeah. and be putting them in the place of accelerating the pace of the innovation, if you look at the, the DARP E program in the US, actually, that is still going on, of, of actually moving those things forward. If you, you don't want to take your eye, you need to put your eye on that ball completely. And if you keep it in the fossil side of things, you could be creating a whole other stranded asset in the mix. Yeah. So why not kind of We have two eyes. Go. We can actually keep an eye on both. And so I think you, there's a power of the and, the Jim Collins story here. You can't, there's no awe in this discussion. As long as we agree on the goal, 
okay, which yeah. is zero emissions. As long as we say we've got to solve this on a line, I think you've got a, a lot of ands you can use. But I agree with you. It's not one instead of the other to help us get to a low carbon world. I think you've got to say it's a transition. I, I like the word transition with metrics. But it's also a portfolio, right? I mean, yeah. it's not about choosing yeah. solar, yeah. wind, or... No, but yeah. Yeah. Is there a danger... But if you have a portfolio, that also means risking along the way. So the yes. ability of governments also to welcome that risk taking along right. the way currently for necessarily an appetite for that but also the demand side policies I mean if you look yes. 100 years ago mass production which was a mass yeah. you know kind of innovation at the time changing yes. production distribution would not have had the effect it did without the demand pull from suburbanization I agree so in that. many ways these green policies that are not necessarily out there systemically could even be a pull for how the IT revolution the previous tech revolution gets fully deployed and diffused across the economy because mm -hmm. it still hasn't compared to the speed of, say, electricity. Yeah. Right. Jennifer, do you worry that you know putting some of these policies in place will be hard and therefore governments will back away from it? I don't think the putting. I think the policies are quite clear. I think that um, we know we have we have uh, the reporting standards we have. We know what to do on renewable energy. We've researched it. We know long, loud, uh, clear signals are the key. Um, so I think the, the, the seemingly hard part, which doesn't need to be as hard as it seems, is for government leaders to actually sit down and put this all together with the experts around the world and listen to the public uh, as well as, you know, smart innovators to put it in place. And I don't feel the courage right now in a lot of those um, CEOs or in a lot of those leaders. But they, but it's there, and I think the the other factor to bring in here is I think we're on we're in the midst of like the largest civil society uh, and public movements that we have seen we haven't seen this since like the Vietnam War or before the Iraq War. That's not going to start. Not, that's not going to stop. So um, it's just getting started actually, and you'll hear youth talk about that. So I I don't think it's policy wise. I don't think it's hard. You can get a big part of what we need with existing technologies, yeah. it's actually the politics that is holding us back on this. And that's what I think, that's why that need to really bring in the, the public, the expertise, you know, I think oftentimes that's not enough in the room of the scientific community that really knows how to move forward. But also but new policy instruments. I mean, you yeah. know, in Europe, for example, there's a new instrument around missions. And the idea is that you have a 100 billion horizon program around innovation, and now part of it will, in fact, be focused on moonshots. And these aren't kind of random pet projects that a minister decides. Right. These are, you know, the big question is bringing citizens to the fore to even kind of think about what does a green city look like. But that becomes the condition through which you then access the funding. So instead of picking winners, this idea of what are we yeah. investing in, you pick right. the willing. But to even have access to any of these funds, you need to be willing to experiment towards a solution. Mm -hmm. But that required a new policy instrument. But transitions are, are difficult sometimes, right? Uh, yes, uh, they, can be, um, they can be difficult. They're easier, look, any, any journey, any transition is easier if you know where you're going. And so the clarity of, uh, of the objective, um, clarity and credibility about the direction of government policy and the consistency of that commitment, even if it's starting relatively small, carb low carbon tax, but with, with, um, with a credible uh, trajectory to where it's going, um, or, or a sustained uh, R&D effort or you know, highlights around certain skills that work in certain areas, all of those things signal to individuals, to companies, to investors, where to put their money, where the opportunity is. And then what the market will do is it will pull forward adjustment. It will act more rapidly than actually uh, pol and policy will help fill in. And without question, you know, um, public, um, public attitudes and, um, uh, and, and pressure and other things also help shape uh, those decisions as well. And, and, and I think that's part of what we're seeing uh, in terms of the response, because the response again, in finance, if you look at what's happening in finance, you have the core of the financial system, all the investors, wanting information about what? About the transition. Mm. Now, different investors are going to have a slightly different view or a different view on how fast it's going, where to put their bets. That's fine. You have the Bank of England and a number of other central banks uh, will do this as well, stress testing their banks for a transition to net zero. Okay, so the world's largest, most complex financial system, that's what we're doing. So at the core of the system, now these questions are being asked, and are you on the right side or the wrong side of that transition? And if you're on the wrong side, what are you going to do about it? Why are investors suddenly realizing this is an issue? Is it the protests in the street? 
or is it something else? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's a combination of things. I think I mean the the biggest investors, uh, biggest asset owners are going to be around 30 years from now, and, and so they can see the uh, the implications, <coughs> uh, likely implications for their assets. They, the the people at the front line were in the insurance and reinsurance industry, where they're dealing with the pricing costs of this every day. Um, but then as well, people are responding to their clients, and actually, you know, they're not disembodied. These institutions, they're made up of individuals and they can see the, the imperative. And in the end, you know, what is the, what is the market system? What's it there for? It's to solve problems, right? It's to find solutions. It's becoming pretty clear that this is, if it's not the biggest problem, it is in the top three and therefore um, that's where the market will go. So I, um, not to pour a cold shower on that point, but your new role, uh, I mean, and uh, what you bring to the table uh, is really key because uh, I was CEO for 15 years almost. I had 60 quarterly earnings calls yeah. with my investors and I never got asked once. I, exactly. And it, but, once. And when did you start okay. being a CEO? Uh, last year, a year yeah. or so ago. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Not, I didn't, I mean, so not once did I get asked by a financial owner about my KPIs on my SDGs or on my climate change trajectory, even though we'd make great progress. So I do think we need to take advantage of this tipping point mm. that I totally agree with, that we've arrived at, uh, society speaking and yeah. speaking loudly, the next generation speaking and speaking loudly. Uh, we have the UN goals. We need to incorporate them in through the financial system. The other vacuum is political. Um, which I'd love to hear more about from Ariana and others, which is uh, we have this notion that we're going to lose jobs in this transition. Mm -hmm. um, there is evidence now that is showing that, no, we're going to actually yeah. gain jobs. Yeah, uh, we need to be very clear then on the transition for the worker mm -hmm. uh, because the worker is the one very afraid and voting Okay, in certain countries, not you know, the US being one of them, uh, about I'm going to lose my job and I'm afraid. Uh, so we've got to do a lot about that. What is that transition for that worker? How do we put that in place? Where are the policies around that? Uh, I know corporations are doing some work on this, but they're fragmented. You can't do it from the corporate sector alone. You can do a lot, but not what governments can do. So I think those two areas but need to be addressed. Can I just come back, though, yeah. in terms of yeah. uh, the degree of shareholder activism on these issues? Yeah. So um, yes, um, until the last couple of years. Yeah. But if you look at major systemic banks, you'll get two thirds of the questions at their AGMs around, yeah. around these issues. Tripling of uh, proxy actions that have it's happened changing. over time. It is shifting very rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. And the question that people are effectively as asking is, it's not divest overnight, I mean, some are, but it's, yeah. what's your plan? Yeah. And, right. and, yeah. and you see it, I mean, we're just in a room with a bunch of CEOs yeah. where yeah. Uh, they're all clocked, okay. No, uh, and some, a lot of them have yeah. the plan, yeah. Yeah. but I think everybody in that room knows they need a plan. I agree with Andrew, that. can I ask you a question then, it's Jennifer and Mariana. Yeah. You talk about the tipping point. If we are to see a recession in the next 12 months, yeah. will, will that goodwill go away? Yeah, well, so maybe I'm a perennial optimist on what's going on with this world, but we, we have a technology revolution that's creating a, a new economic growth that we actually, if you look at these trillion dollar market cap companies that are appearing, yeah. uh, we're becoming richer. The world's becoming richer. Are we distributing it perfectly? No. Are we actually finding a way to actually put the right policies in place for this century? No. Uh, and frankly, this is where government incentives are not working very well. Uh, now, the leading corporations are doing a great job of job creation in their supply chains. But you're right. I mean, if it scales back, uh, so I'm saying there won't be a recession. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the governor has some views on that. But I, I, I'm not planning. I'm yeah, I, I don't <laughs> think. Well, we had 08, 09, yeah. and we all got scared, and we all got uh, way different in our forecasting. But look, I think technology-driven growth of the type we're seeing will keep our world at the 3 to the 3% level for a while. I think we have some time to get this right. My personal view, not a lot of time for this transition. But you're right, you know, corporations will march to a different tune if they suddenly start losing money. Now, that's where your point comes yeah. in, Mark. And I think it's important that they get the KPIs right. Yeah, and the KPIs, and maybe just a couple points <clears throat> on the transition. I mean, I think, yes, a plan, but it needs to be earlier than, okay, the 2050 piece, but it needs to be a plan for the next few years. Yes. It needs to have milestones. Yeah, you need to have, there, yeah. Right? I and I mean, this net zero by 2050 thing is not actually, it's far from adequate. We need it to be uh, much earlier. I mean, 
the net zero, but then also we need to see the commitments of the companies and the governments before then. And that's one thing. On the transition, I also wanted to raise the just transition. Yes. Uh, and I wanted to link into the, the, the inequality that we have in our world today, because as we know, not everyone is getting rich or, or richer. Correct. So first is to make sure that there is a just transition for the workers that, that have given great wealth to our societies, yes. right? And to make sure that that is built in to any agreement and transition plan. But the other thing that I think gets less um, attention than it has, and I'm starting to call it socially just climate policy because I can't think of a shorter name, is the fact that you see if climate policy isn't put in, in, in place with uh, in mind with the people who are, who are trying to make ends meet, the cost that will go on to those people, right, is deeply unfair. It is avoidable. Right. It is avoidable. And it causes polarization in our societies. And that's the risk, I think, in the transition if people aren't smart. Those, you know, you could, Australia did this, right? Half of the population yeah. in another government didn't pay taxes anymore, right. right? So I just think that is a key part that we need to take care of people. And that's linked to social inequality today. Uh, and it can be done, but I think it's often overlooked. Yeah. Mariana, then go. Leads into what I wanted to say, which is that there's this underlying assumption, unless we make it clear, that this is all win-win. You know, this is all good, innovate, invest, transform, transition. And actually, along the way, we have to make certain types of activities less profitable, including, you know, we can talk about the problems with shareholder maximization and the need for stakeholder maximization, but you know, the amount of, for example, share buybacks just in the last 10 years has exceeded $4 trillion uh, in, you know, globally. That currently is bringing profits to, you know, parts of the system. And profits currently are at record high. So the profit share of GDP is at a record high. Investment globally has actually been falling. And this is fundamentally an effect of the lack of reinvestment back into the system. So you talked about market cap. That's not about investment. That's just about rewards going to particular, you know, one percent. Yeah. And this is important to realize that, you know, this isn't again about just saying, oh, let's do it differently. There have to be strong conditions attached. And I always go back to the IT revolution because I do think there's some really interesting lessons. One of the most innovative companies actually in that period was um, Bell Labs, a, you know, a very innovative company, uh, R&D laboratory outside of that came out of AT&T, that came from government forcing AT&T to reinvest its profits back in the real economy, back in innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms in order to maintain its monopoly. Mm. So looking at the monopolies, including the kind of Aramcos in terms of yeah. you know, market share and subsidies, there should be strong conditionalities in place in order even just to maintain their existing status quo. But that does mean change, and that change in the short term will mean profitability going down in certain sectors unless course, they change. Of course, yeah. that's what winners and losers mean. It means yeah. not just profitability going down, it means um, companies going out of business and sectors yeah. uh, uh, becoming sunset industries. But I'll make a couple more points, uh, if I may. Uh, first, on the uh, regressivity point, uh, abs absolutely right to be careful on climate policy on that. I think we'd all agree that climate change itself is regressive. It hurts the most vulnerable uh, the most, both within a country and, uh, and globally. And we're seeing that with increasing frequency. Um, uh, and so secondly, when you put in place climate policy, in particularly if it's a price on carbon, thinking about how you recycle that price in carbon and whether that's progressive or not is, is hugely important. Um, and uh, obviously, there is, um, you know, there are winners and losers, and there needs to be uh, restructuring. That's always the case, as you know, in the in the economy. This just happened. This is the new big vector of that. Last point I'll, I'll make, if I may, which is around technology. If you think about the applications now on technology, just a couple examples in the overall transition. You think about precision agriculture um, and using uh, computing power and Microsoft and others there. You think about grid optimization uh, through artificial intelligence. Um, again, I'll come back on uh, carbon sequestration and the opportunities in agriculture carbon sequestration, not, not injection, but ag um, and. You know, these are huge opportunities. There, there is no one answer, but it is a way that technology spreads out um, and, helps, um, and helps address this challenge. Can, can I go back on Mariana's yep. point about share buyback and dividends, and the governor is going to uh, look at me and grimace a little bit here, but I, I, <laughs> I would say the last 20 years of monetary policy has created lots of new financial instruments where public companies have had to be responsive to, to short-term profits. 
And so unfortunately, many of us who ran public companies, I run public company, ran a public company, uh, the quarterly march through earnings created this need to actually buy back shares, increase dividend yield to attract new money. Uh, activist investors became part of our life, hedge funds became part of our life, and the long-term investor disappeared on us. Okay, and actually, strangely enough, in the 80s, I would have said the long-term investors uh, were around in big swaths and private equity came along and they were short-term. Today, I consider private equity long-term. Uh, private equity, private capital has become much more long-term than the public markets. And this is the excess of monetary policy. We've got a swath of money up there trying to find returns, pension funds, you name it. So actually, it's a lack of fiscal policy, uh, the lack of courage in fiscal policy that doesn't build infrastructure, doesn't build education, doesn't build systems for the 21st century. The lack of courage in the political sector yeah. has created this monetary situation which has to be remedied and I'm glad this is exactly what you're asking for and what we need. We need long-term public sector investors back. But then but you need to redesign the tax system too. I mean, you well, you've got gains. tons of work yeah. in that area. Yeah, but but yeah. those same companies, I mean, you're yeah. blaming the politicians and the policies, but there's massive lobbying efforts to reduce you know, capital gains, for example. It's and we should be circle. taxing material more than labor. We could redesign the whole tax system. You know, not, not just about carbon taxes, but literally, you know, co corporate income tax, capital gains tax, uh, taxes on labor versus materials in order to reach the objectives we're talking about. So you about. may not have liked the BRT statement, but that was a sign that the business community is fed up with this vicious circle of economy that we've created, that one begets the other, and that we've got to take a stand on inclusive capitalism and actually multi-stakeholder returns and rewards. There was a massive signal. That was not an easy thing to get. I was part of the executive committee that got us to that point, that we just can't report a return to one sector of the economy, mm -hmm. that you've got to think about just transitions. You've got to think about communities. You've got to think about how actually you can help educate politicians to give you the long-term trajectories. But is there, is there an alternative to capitalism? Or how would you reform uh, I, capitalism? I hate to think of an alternative to capitalism. Maybe you, some of your terms are used. But democracy and capitalism in its current form is not distributing capital in the right way to the affected communities. That's the answer. So we've got to find a better way of doing it. Inclusive capitalism is a term being used. Uh, there's a lady behind me that runs something called FCLT Global, Focus Capital on the Long Term. Yes. Sarah, someone behind yep. me here. Um, that's a <laughs> big, the big movement. Uh, what Larry Fink's been saying and you know the passive the index funds and what they need to do. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. Yeah, but Larry Fink and two of the other largest asset managers have increased since 2015 in the Paris Agreements, their investments in fossil fuels. Exactly. I mean, the degree I mean, to which this goes to the point. center of the value chain yeah. will determine whether this word inclusive capitalism is just bullshit or not, right? So, I mean, currently, unfortunately, there's lots of talk, but the actual walk continues to be not going in this direction. And the, literally, the lobbying effort that gets done in order to keep the system yep. to be rewarding short-term capital, it's you know, huge. why don't we have a financial transaction tax? But has something tax? changed, like, but Brian, has something changed in, in, because of <laughs> what some of the big asset managers came out to say that was loudly applauded by actually a significant change in how they view risk and sustainability. Does that not change a lot? And that was two weeks ago. Well, we'll see. But I think what will really cause change is if the way we govern business, the way that finance is steered, the way that policy is used both ambitiously, and it's not just basic research, uh, Mark, which you mentioned several times, many of the innovations you talked about actually even downstream are coming out of you know, ambitious public investments yeah. like out of RPE, which you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and the way that these organizations relate one to another less parasitically, you know, we've socialized the risks, privatized the rewards after the financial crisis. We're risking to do the same thing around the green economy. How we're actually going to distribute the value that comes about by having this active public, you know, inclusive capitalism investment is, is, you know, it's not clear right now given how the contracts are set up. I mean, just yeah. maybe a couple, a couple yeah. points. I mean, because I think, you know, we, we issued a report today called It's the Finance Sector Stupid. Because I think although this group gets mm. it, um, I think it's, it, it's not well known around the world, the culpability of the financial sector in causing the climate crisis. And there may be these types of statements that are out there, but you know, since the Paris Agreement was agreed, you had $1.4 trillion from 24 banks that have come here in the last five years going into fossil fuel investments, mm -hmm. right? So pardon me if I am not very convinced, uh, no matter how hard it was to get that done, which petrifies me a bit because you know the interests uh, clearly aren't where they need to be right now. Uh, but I think 
getting those uh, the policy frameworks in place that will move this in the in the central banking system across the disclosure side of things, yeah. moving the subsidies and moving away from a definition where GDP is the thing that defines uh, what what growth is, what what well-being is. So moving more into something that that looks at our health systems, that looks at that looks at um, do we have a, an ecosystem and a living earth that we can actually all live on. Moving more into that direction, right? You have a New Zealand that's starting to work there. There's been work that's done on that. But to me, that would at least start redefining some of these things and address some of these gaps that are there and the fact that we are using these resources as if we could use them forever, and we know that we can't. So there's some key parts of this. Yeah, there's key parts. Can I pick yep. up on that? Um, okay, we have COP26, uh, November 9th and 19th in Glasgow. You're all invited. Um, <coughs> and let's channel some of this energy. I mean, there's lots of issues, but let's channel some of this energy, particularly around the finance se sector. Um, so what does the finance sector need? What, what do, do private financial actors need to do? What do regulators and authorities who govern that, what do they need to do to put in place uh, the information, the risk management, and, and the return uh, vectors, the, the way they manage returns, um, uh, that take climate into account in every single professional financial decision? Okay? That's, the, that's the question. We've got a, we have a plan to do that. It's open source, come in, feed into it, help shape it. I start with this. Let's start with the system we have today. The meeting is in 10 months. We're not going to fundamentally change the system or the starting place we have today. Let's move that system so that the core of what is, you know, is being demanded, which we move to a net zero or to a zero world, you can define it as zero world, but a world where we stabilize the climate in as as, as rapidly as possible, get behind that agenda or improve that agenda, but within the context of where we're starting from today. And I think actually you do have, jury will be out, we'll see whether what happens. From where I sit, and all I do is talk to financial institutions, well, three quarters of my day, there is a fundamental reshaping of the system underway. Underway, not assured underway. And the question is whether it gets pushed in. How difficult is it? So the, the more questions you ask about your company and how it, it, you know, it deals with climate change and how many more questions are there? Is it, is it well, much more the, complex that's the than thing, we thought it was? Once you, get, once you get everybody talking about the transition, exposing whether company A thinks the transition is over 40 years, company B thinks it's in 10, you know, investor Y wants it in a shorter time period, etc. Yep. Once you get a common uh, approach to this and dialogue around it, then you have a market, then you know where to put the pressure. Right now, the conversation can be deflected so easily yeah. because different people are talking about different priorities with a different language, and that's why we need a conversation. But the language, right. sorry. No, go ahead, Mario. The, the language needs to change, right? So we often hear leveling the playing field. Right. You're talking about tilting the playing field massively towards a green direction. And currently, if you look sector by sector, there's yeah huge differences in how corporates behave. When we talk about stakeholder capitalism, some currently are governed by stakeholder capitalism. Even in telecoms, you know, yeah. Huawei is a cooperative. Ericsson has workers on the board. Cisco has done um, one of the biggest, you know, buyback schemes in the last uh, 10 years. So there are ways that we can fundamentally tilt the playing field so that we reward long-termism, we reward mm -hmm. green transformations in sectors, worker training in order to transit Can I just make, uh, can I make one quick ways. point, though, on yeah. buybacks and returning sh capital mm -hmm. to shareholders, mm -hmm. which is, as part of the transition, what you will want, we will want, <laughs> is that big energy companies are buying back a lot of stock and returning a lot of capital to shareholders because their, their, their core activity, those who haven't reinvested in new energy, yeah. has to be returned. Because what happens to that? It doesn't just sit with shareholders. Yeah. They don't just look at it. But that assumes they there's no opportunity. They reinvest it in the op they, yeah. But it depends on whether they have the capabilities because not every big energy company yeah is going to be a winner in the transition because they haven't developed these core competencies. No. It's the flip side of, 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 of people uh, not, not adjusting. Now, some of them might, and we want a system that moves the capital from those who are going to be left behind to no. those who might be moving ahead. I want to be responsive to Mariana's challenge. I mean, uh, frustration, talking about it. Uh, time is over, you know, and yeah. so it's not what, it's the famous quote, I hate to use his, I won't use his name, but it's not what you expect, it's what you inspect. So please, COP26, KPIs. Yeah. KPIs around climate change goals. That keep, will keep force. performance indicators for those who don't 
Follow key you. performance yeah. indicators. Yeah. Yeah. Metrics. Yep. Metrics yep. that business will respond to metrics. Hold people accountable for yep. it. Okay? Money goes to those metrics. Mm. Okay? They won't get behaviour change unless you do that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay? You, you'll get more of the same. You'll get talk. Mm -hmm. You'll get conferences like this that don't yield in any outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Outcomes will come if you change the key performance indicators. And, and, and the perception yeah. of opportunity. And, make them, and, just, and the opportunity. And make them mandatory because these voluntary yeah, things exactly. aren't. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. a good, that's a good place for pressure, by the way, yeah. is on that. Exactly, yeah. Ma mandatory. But also the innovation agenda. Don't write off big oil. Let big oil become energy. Let it become sustainable energy. It can do it. There are some that are actually leading it right now, and I include in Ramco in that. But, you know, the transition word is key. Uh, how very how key. long? So we're running out of time. Let me yeah. ask you each: Sorry. How long do you think the transition will be? First, is it closer, <laughs> or or is it further than we think? Well, if you're looking at me, my job right now is to make it closer. I think I'm an advocate. I'm uh, an activist, if you want to use that term. Are we talking but decades I'm informed. or five years? Oh, look, it's going to take us most of this decade. But if it doesn't take us most of this decade, we're not going to like the answer in 2030. We cannot get to 2030 and have this discussion. Okay, <laughs> uh, and so we now. Mariana? Now, but I just want to come back to your early, I'll say it really quickly. The first question you asked Jennifer is very problematic. We have to stop asking that question. It's not about growth or, you know, or yeah, you know, what not to do. Warren Buffett, and he was not a communist. He is not a communist, I promise. He's a capitalist. He always says, stop reducing my tax. I don't even care about that. I invest when I see an opportunity. What we need to do is create opportunities, increase expectations okay. of future growth opportunities in this that area. Was, that was he, and okay. So how do we measure it? Let's not talk about GDP. <laughs> how do you measure it? <laughs> GDP attached with some kind of sustainability index? What, how measure do we at the measure macro it? level. Yeah. I'm interested in measuring what often gets called the ecosystem, but then any biologist will tell you what kind of ecosystem. Is it mutualistic or parasitic? How can we restructure public and private actors to actually get mutualistic, progressive, not regressive, yep. ecosystems, which is public-private partnerships. That word is no longer fashionable. Right. But, but we're you're gonna... still using GDP as a metric. No, the structure. We need lawyers. I mean, I don't like lawyers. But actually, we need now. legal <laughs> innovations in this area. We have incredibly problematic contracts, relationships in the current state of capitalism in different sectors, but given that this is the one that has to change within 10 years, right? Within, otherwise we're screwed massively. Mm -hmm. We do need to have indicators of how we're working together to get this done. And if we're doing it wrongly, then you know the money, for example, coming from governments has to stop in a particular area. That's what I mean by conditionalities. That's what got the steel sector in Germany to be the only innovative in the green sense steel sector almost in the world. Okay, so how long do you think the transition will be? Five, ten years longer? Well, we don't have a choice. It has to be less than ten, otherwise it's bye. But it's not what you want, it's what no, you no, think. But, how long yeah, do you think it'll today, take place? Today, like when I mentioned the procurement budget in the UK for the Ministry of Transport, it's, clo it's over 30 billion. Right? So if you today said we're going to procure differently, it's not going to just be about costs and kind of minimum, you know, cost, minimum quality just to get a job done. If everything becomes about transitioning in this way, it means tomorrow okay. the way that governments procure changes, the way that businesses get evaluated right. um, and basically can survive or not, given that so many subsidies are allowing businesses to survive, would change. We can change that tomorrow. People stopped smoking in Italy, where I'm from, overnight because there was a ban. No, it was. It was almost overnight. I mean, almost. They, they still park on the zebra crossings in front of schools because there's no fine. People do change. Yeah. Governor really? Carney, how long do you think the transition is? Uh, the, the honest answer, I don't know how long the transition is, but what I think, I mean, I, I forgive me, I wouldn't do the, the, it's the finance stupid, I would say it's the transition stupid. So forcing everybody to talk about their view of the transition, their plan, we've got a, we've got a problem, plan beats no plan, that's the one thing I learned in the financial crisis. Um, so we've got a climate crisis, plan beats no plan. What's your plan as a company? What's your plan as a bank? What's your plan as an investor? What's your plan as a government? What's your plan as a media organization around this? What's your plan as an individual? Get it out there. And, then, and that's where, that's where you, you, you start to force the change uh, around it. And look, I'm simple. Finance is what I know. That's how finance will, that's how finance will adjust. And now finance, investors, banks, insurers, asset owners are starting to say, what's your plan? And I'm sure on the Aramco IPO, that question was asked. Over and over. Yeah. 
Well, I think the transition, I think the demands will come for it to happen overnight. It's happening. You heard, I mean, the, the op-ed that, that youth signed up to here was focused on the finance sector. Yeah. I think that that is an incredibly important development that business should be taking into account. It's not only looking at governments, it's also looking at corporates. And it can happen tomorrow. It can happen tomorrow. And the decisions are there. You know, the first study on climate went to Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965. Yeah. Right? That shocked me. So it's not that it's not possible. It's not that we don't know. So, you know, it's, it's there. The technology is there. And um, this decade is the key. But the decade can't be the last, eight, the last two years. Yeah. Glasgow is key. It's not, the, it's not the end. We need to make progress there and need to actually build the confidence for young people around the world that they are not going to face climate chaos when they're 20 years old. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for a spirited conversation. Thank you.